Hi, we're here at uh, Screenplays Media Innovation Summit in Santa Clara, uh, not too far away from Harmonix headquarters, yep. and we have an opportunity to sit with Tom Latte, who is the Vice President of Product Management for Harmonic. Tom, thanks a lot for taking some time with us. You're welcome. Um, big changes going on right now as far as the directions that uh, Harmonic is going with uh, your technology. Over the course of the last year, we've seen you introduce ever more functionality and options in the software space as the um, um, multi-screen environment has emerged as a key target and and at the same time making serious improvements in the in your legacy hardware based uh, encoding systems mm -hmm. um, I'd like to just get up to date with briefly with what what it is that are the new benchmarks on both sides yeah um, obviously with the uh, electro system you've got you've got new density, you've got new uh, channelization capabilities in terms of numbers of streams in a channel and that sort of thing. Can you talk to me a little bit about what is happening in that? Sure, I'd, I'd love to. Yeah. You know, Harmonic bought, uh, bought Rosette probably four years ago, and, and Rosette a, a, a well, is and was a well-known software transcoding platform, and for, for a number of years we ran them kind of as an independent business unit, really focused on a part of the mar market that Harmonic traditionally didn't focus on. Uh, and we continue to focus on our video processing for service providers with our, our hardware set products, as, as you talked about. And I think we've learned a couple things over that time. And what you've seen in the last year is really the marriage of, of those things. And, and you know, we had not really ever sold a software-only product before as a company from a video processing perspective. And we learned a lot through the interactions with those, those Rosette customers. And as over the last two years, we pulled that portfolio more into the, the, the internals, if you will, of Harmonic. Uh, we really try to see how we could leverage what we learned in, in the software space and extend it while also maintaining our, our hardware business. Uh, first and foremost, what I think we learned from the software uh, examples is there, there is a huge demand in certain workflows and, and use cases for software transcoding on, on general IT type infrastructure. One of the, uh, the bigger challenges of that software product though is it, it had none of the kind of harmonic DNA from video processing. So about two years ago we started our own software codec uh, initiative to actually build our own H.264 codec in mm -hmm. software, mirroring what we had done uh, for so many years in hardware. Uh, and, and really we think it's, it's not a, an either or situation now that we look at it, but really beneficial. We now, can model a lot of things in software, had, for example. Had, had you done your own codec in H.264 for your hardware platform already? We had. You know, for, for, since the beginning of time uh, from the company, we, we licensed compression chips, uh, but, but the implementation of, of of how the coding works, the decisions we make, the pre-processing, all of the things that really differentiate a, a broadcast encoder, Harmonic had invested in uh, from the very beginning as leaders, you know, whether it be the, the first broadcast encoder, the first multipass encoder, the first StatMux encoder, we're all, all from Harmonic heritage. Uh -huh. Interesting that you, you, you kind of had to start over again when it came to the software environment uh, to, to build it yeah. for that environment. Well, I would say start over and it takes time to, to actually do the work. Yeah. You know, interestingly enough, uh, a lot of the lessons that we've learned over many years uh, in the hardware space are, are directly applicable to the software space. And it's more, I would say, about blocking and tackling the implementation than it is inventing the approach uh -huh. to, to achieve a, a good software product, uh, codec, in that regard. Now, as a result of that, how would you characterize some of the differences that have emerged in the new software codec, uh, H.264, versus what you were dealing with prior? Well, I would say, you know, relative to the, the codec we had kind of licensed off the shelf, we're about 35% better today already, kind of in the last couple of releases, we started releasing our own codec. And by 35%, uh, you mean efficiency on? Yeah, so we'll, we'll say, you know, better picture, or same picture with 35% less bits, is kind of how we measure in the industry. That's uh, a huge improvement. It, it is, it is, but I, I think that uh, it goes to show how much room was available for us to, to innovate on, using the lessons we had learned from so many years in, in the hardware space. And that has a direct impact of course on on just how many streams you can support off a blade in a in a in a uh, software environment right yeah I, I think it has two benefits you know we have a kind of a dual pronged approach one is improving the video quality and i think that as these over the top services become more uh, ubiquitous they're now facing the challenge of how efficient that video quality is i mean netflix famously 
about nine months ago after the launch in Canada, had to go and change all the encoding rates for their video services because mm -hmm. the average Canadian couldn't watch that many hours of content because of data caps. Yeah. Right, so some of those same things we've learned in the broadcast space, more channels per qualm or per transponder or over a DSL link are now relevant and, and, and critical in, in, a, in an over-the-top environment. The other thing that we're focused on, and we've just begun this, is, is really how are we more efficient in the software implementation to leverage more efficiently the, the Intel processor that we're basing these products on. Mm. Uh, in other words, how do we get more density on a given Intel core uh, than previously? Yeah. Uh -huh. And th that involves you know, new architectures and how we, 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 we leverage the resources within that Intel processor more intelligently. Um, I think that what our customers want is not only a lower cost per stream, but a more power efficient uh, use of the hardware that they have. Uh, now, if, if you do t 1080p in software, does, is that pretty much eat up the processing as far as having any other streams available off of that uh, blade? So I would say, yeah, today, today a 1080p uh, stream can, can definitely consume an entire, you know, eight core Intel processor. And, uh -huh. and, you know, we think that the challenge there is, is, is not to get a faster processor from Intel, but, you know, we don't believe that, that the industry today is maybe, including ourselves, is as efficient as we could be in, in how we're utilizing all the resources in that chip. And that's where we're really focused on you know, to our so customers. we can see the opportunity might emerge where that could coexist with other streams on that processor? That's definitely our intent. Wow. Our, our intent is you know, customers who have our software-based appliances today to extract a higher density out of those than, than they had previously. Of course, today most people aren't looking at haven't been looking at uh, the software solutions as a 1080p option at all. Correct. But going down the road, when if and when they do, then the fact that there may be more uh, streams available than, because I mean, right now the assumption is, well, if we ever went to 1080p, it would wipe out all this uh, variety of other streams we could do on a processor. Well, I, I think that's true. I, mean, I think it's always important to think, even if we could do more or can do more eventually on, on a given Intel platform, that still may not always be the best economic choice. Mm -hmm. You know, today in our in our Electra and ProStream platforms, we're talking about, you know, eight HD, tw up to 20 HD services out of a single device, that device yeah. is a few hundred watts. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, w when you look at what is the best mix, uh, it always does depend on what the operator is trying to achieve. And that's, that's the other side of this coin, where, where while you're making these advances and great strides in the efficiency by going to your own codec and software and these things of using the core processor more efficiently, et cetera, <laughs> you're leaping ahead with on the hardware side mm -hmm. in terms of much greater density. Um, and and it, it just feels like that track is, is, is more productive and, and, and ultimately in the efficiency side, even though the other track is more productive in flexibility or something. I, I agree. I, I think when we talk about broadcast codecs and, and, and what have you, MPEG-2 and MPEG-4, you know, as, as the, the playing field narrows, if you will, we can get a lot more efficiencies by focusing on, on a narrower set of codecs and get that kind of density, you know, with our Electro 9000 or our ProStream product where we're talking, you know, uh, multiple versions of, of the same service within the same box at a low power consumption without compromising on video quality. So by narrowing the scope of the problem, you can uh, you leverage hardware to, to have a, a higher density and power efficiency than you, you could in software. Yeah, so now, now that that's becoming the case and, the, and, and, and it's pretty evident what the disparities are, I, I guess my question is, I can see the efficiencies that are driving people to look at a uh, you know, a, um, a, a, a universal infrastructure that they can leverage on servers as a next generation head end for multi-device service and, and factoring in all IP for delivery of their mainstream services mm -hmm. as well around this sort of data center head end. Um, and yet, is that going to really fly in the context of the kind of density and efficiencies that you're getting on the hardware side. Do you see, in other words, evolving demand on both ends, or is this a temporary phenomenon? I, I think there is evolving demand on both ends. I, I think it comes down to what you want to use um, the infrastructure for. If you're talking about a, a live linear broadcast channel that's running 24 hours a day, seven days a week, there's value in purpose-built hardware for that because you're not trying to be flexible. If you're talking about leveraging a, uh, an IT or cloud infrastructure because you have burst capacity and maybe today it's doing software transcoding and tomorrow it's running your, your month-end close and the day after that it's running mm -hmm. something else, there's a lot of benefit to that. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, and I, I think we have to, 
to, to see what the best application is based upon what the customer wants. It's also important to point out that even in, in the IT world, uh, there's not one blade that solves all use cases and all problems. When you get down to the actual hardware, even in an Intel infrastructure, if I'm running a large database cluster, I have a different characteristic of that than if I'm running a, a, a compute farm, mm -hmm. right? The database may have more RAM and less CPU power because that's what's required to make that an efficient and scalable solution. Yeah, it's not all it's not all generic. Exactly. Yeah. 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 Dell does not have one black, one brand of servers, nor does HP. And, I think and and so I'm gathering from your response to my question that it it really isn't a matter. Okay, this operator is going to go all data center future, and this operator is going to stick with an all hardware approach. There's going to be mixes of the two, uh, depending yes. on the, the application and the needs. And, and, and I, I would assume, depending on uh, uh, how much is localized and how much is centralized, uh, wouldn't that be a factor as to whether you wanted to go one direction or another? The more local content, you want to have a low cost environment out there, multi purpose, and use those blades, whereas for the high concentration of your broadcast and, and, a, and a centralized head end, you'd be more interested in this this high density, low wattage uh, yeah, hardware based I, environment. I think, I think it's a fair, I think it's a fair statement. I think when you begin to centralize that infrastructure, you get economies of scale and there is value in, in some purpose built built hardware there, particularly for linear. I think when you talk about file based video processing workflows where you know, the number of codecs and destinations and use cases is variable. Uh, again, that playing field broadens and so you need the flexibility of a software codec. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about broadcast television, whether it be over the internet or satellite or cable, uh, we're talking about a much narrower set of video processing requirements and there's some real advantages both from a uh, density, power consumption and, and overall manageability to, to use some, some purpose-built technologies, which, by the way, are a combination of hardware and software, let's not forget yeah. that, uh, with, within that package. Good. I'd like to switch gears for a moment okay. while we have a little bit of time uh, to talk about, on the hardware side, this, this move to uh, 4 MPEG-2 HD mm -hmm. uh, streams in a 6 megahertz QAM channel. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, uh, it wasn't long ago we were raising questions as, well, is th th is it really feasible to do three HDs, and, and are, are they working out very well? And there's, you know, been mixed signals on uh, on that question over the course of the time, two or three years, that that's been a, a, an available option. And now, suddenly, we're going to four. Yes. So tell me a little bit about it, how how you leapfrog into four when when those lingering questions were still out there on three. Well, I, I think, well, first of all, you know, video quality is always in the eye of the beholder. Mm -hmm. But, I, you know, part of this goes back to, to your, uh, our conversation a moment ago about, about the best tool for the job. What we've seen in the last two or three years, particularly around um, video compression ASIC technology, where as die sizes get smaller, we can put more computational power uh, into a chip. Things that we never thought were possible before relative to MPEG-2 video quality efficiencies are now available whether that's more passes of the video to find the ideal, ideal bit rate, more mode decision about what mode we use per picture. So these kinds of things that you could always model in software, and if you had unlimited amounts of cores and unlimited amount of time, you could always make the most pristine picture. The challenge is how do you make that most pristine picture in real time? Mm -hmm. And as you get more compute power within the, these chip cores that we leverage in our broadcast encoders, we're really able to drive that video quality down to the point where, to your, your, your comment earlier, six years ago it was you know, two channels per qualm and that was considered you know, maybe okay. And in reality, the reason we've been able to go to that three and four channels per qualm is, for the most part, because the video quality is the same as it was six years ago, although the bit rate is lower. Mm -hmm. Now, part of that's the video compression technology that we're employing. Part of that is also up the food chain. You know, six years ago, we were a very tape-based infrastructure. Lots of in and out of tapes in that post-production process. Lots of generational loss. Uh -huh. As we move to more file-based workflows, fewer codec transformations up the food chain, the quality of the the video coming into the service provider has also improved. Uh -huh. right? We always say in the industry, garbage in, garbage out. Yeah. Right? As that gets better yeah. and we get better, the two things to, together have really allowed us to, to achieve a much higher video quality at, at a much lower bit rate than, than I think anyone had foreseen you know, five or six years ago. It is amazing. Um, it, and yet there are those that would say, well, I'm not ready to go there. What, yeah. I, but are those that aren't ready to go there, maybe now at three, it's gotten to where they would go there? I, I think, 
you know, I, I think with, with video, you can't always make a, a blanket statement that it would be three or four channels per qualm. Mm -hmm. Some content is always going to be more challenging. Um, you, you get into discussion sure, about the high motion. You get into a conversation about resolution. You know, there's a religious battle sometimes about it has to be full resolution HD. Uh, it's very interesting in the, in the SD world for the longest time. Almost no service provider broadcast full resolution SD. It was always a half resolution or a three quarter resolution. In the HD world, uh, some operators are able to achieve those lower, uh, uh, those higher densities per qualm or per transponder by lowering the resolution of their services. And so there's always that tug of war of, of what your marketing department wants to message, the mm -hmm. complexity of the video. And, and I think much like the technology, one size doesn't fit all. And we have customers today who do still two channels per qualm, three channels per qualm, and four channels per qualm. That may be the same operator in the same system, but mixing those channels differently uh -huh. based upon the value of the content, the complexity of the content, and how they want to differentiate themselves in, in the space. Sure, there's some channels that just don't, don't matter as much as others as far as what the quality is. And, and then yes. there's the whole motion issue as to which ones have more yes. activity and changes in the, in the frames. So it's interesting, the, 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 the dynamic is a little more complex than just making a flat out decision, I'm gonna live with this one or that one. No, I agree, and remember there's multiple tools in, in, in particularly in the MSO's uh, toolkit, right? Mm -hmm. do, I, do I increase the bandwidth on my HFC network? Do I do more node splitting? Do I do more video compression? Do I do switch digital broadcast? And each of our customers in each of the regions kind of have to make those decisions as to you know, what lever do they wanna pull right. in a given time to get the most efficiency. Right. And then <laughs> comes what's next. The multi-screen, yeah. Well, no, no. I'm, I'm talking more about the higher resolution. I mean, we got Blu-ray now as the <laughs> new standard. Yes. Uh, 1080p is, is, is emerging as, you know, what you need to do if you're going to offer video on demand and, and movie channels and, yes. and compete with that quality. And then, and then there's the, the whole home theater service with the early release that's in nascent stages now. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. as it goes up and as the screen sizes get bigger, uh, we have, you know, the next generation of HD out there taking shape. Um, as, as you look at all those things happening, uh, is, are, are, are you already planning and designing systems, encoding systems that would address these kinds of issues down the road? Um, or are things too unsettled to get to where you know which way to go with that? So I think some things are very settled. I, I think when we talk about movie releases and, and 1080p 24, the Blu-ray uh, 1080p, if you will, uh, you know, we, were one of the, we were the first company to enable our customers to do that. DirecTV and Echostar both announced those services a couple years ago mm -hmm. for their movies. Um, that's a nice one in the sense that it doesn't really take any more bandwidth, uh, but because it's progressive, it can offer a better picture quality. Uh, I think when we talk about 1080p 60 and, 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 and kind of full resolution, uh, 60 frames per second content. Uh, that is something that all of our products, whether they be in the compression space or our production and playout products, support that today and we've planned for that and we, we've done trials with customers. Uh, that's really a more, uh, the infrastructure exists, the content isn't quite there yet and the, the production of that content, whether it be cameras and switchers and the whole production environment to create content of that mm -hmm. quality mm -hmm. to then get to the next stage of, of, of broadcasting. I think 3D is in, in a very similar uh, uh, boat. We have many customers today using our product to deliver you know, so-called half-resolution 3D, yeah. uh, and uh, many consumers are happy with that. I, I think there's a constant tug of war as to what consumers want and what consumers are told they want to sell them more televisions, and, and somewhere in the middle, the, the, the truth lies. I, I think from a product standpoint, we, we are pretty innovative in making sure we have that functionality either uh, fallow uh, you know, in the product but not enabled or enabled uh, when our customers uh, need it. So you're, you're ready to support these things as yes. they're coming out. Yeah. Well, that's good news. Tom, well, thank we have, you so much. You're welcome. <laughs> All right.